Let's sound the trumpets for these fallen heroes, even if some of them return before their corpses get cold. Also, beware, there are spoilers ahead. In the world of the X-Men, Charles Xavier devised a complex process to literally resurrect any member of Homo Superior, who no longer resides among the living. This process involves Cerebro automatically backing up the memories of every mutant on the planet, as well as Hope Summers, Tempus, Proteus, Elixir, and Egg all combining their powers. So if Wolverine actually perishes in a definitive way like he did in Logan, Hope and her crew, known as The Five, will make sure he's back and even better at what he does by the next morning. However, in order to bring a mutant back, Professor X and The Five have to remember that mutants existed. This creates a special problem for a member of the Legionnaires, known as Forget-Me-Not, whose power is an inability to register in the memory of other beings. While it might be particularly useful in keeping a low profile, it doesn't aid him in the comics. During Legion of X issue 10, the Sentinels attack Krakoa, and Forget-Me-Not gives his own life in order to protect the island. The techno-organic being known as Warlock also perishes in the scuffle, but the surviving Legionnaires immediately begin laying plans to reassemble him. As far as Forget-Me-Not is concerned, it's impossible to bring back a dead person if you don't remember they ever existed in the first place. In case anyone who watched Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania needs a quick reminder, the glowing cylinder-headed Zalem is a dead giveaway that somebody from the Rick and Morty writing staff had a strong hand in Scott Lang's big-screen adventure. Unfortunately, it appears as if this is a one-and-done deal for the whimsical and eccentric Marvel character after his fate in the movie. Despite his lack of a backstory or really much of an identity beyond his warrior-like disposition and alliance with the Quantum Realm Rebels, audiences felt a slight tug on their heartstrings when Kang popped Zalim's head. Granted, it might have been a very slight tug since no one really knew who he was, but as far as Quantumania characters go, Zalim definitely does more to further the plot than the likes of Lord Kryler or Hope Van Dyne. Zalem didn't deserve a lot better than them, but maybe he deserved a little better here. The MCU's infamously overworked digital designers did the best they could to turn Corey Stoll into a giant head with proportionally tiny arms and legs. Whether they pulled it off or not might be a matter for another debate, but it's clear the character known as a mechanized organism designed only for killing, or simply MODOK, isn't expected to appear in future MCU films. After Cassie Lang reminds Kang's most ridiculous henchman that he doesn't need to be such a horrible person, MODOK takes her advice to heart and bites the dust while helping an army of giant ants vanquish the Quantum Realm's one-time conqueror. With his dying breath, he looks into the eyes of his former arch-enemy, Scott Lang, and says, And at least I died. An Avenger. While MODOK can't legitimately declare himself an Avenger, and Scott probably doesn't have the clout to approve new members, MODOK's last second turn to the heroic side is enough to qualify him for this list. Enough baby legs. By splitting his 12 episodes season 4 and half, Titans made sure we wouldn't know if Jinx survived getting stabbed in the girth with a magic pitchfork in episode 6. It's only in episode 7 that we learn Jinx doesn't make it, and is another superhero casualty of the show, joining the likes of Hawk. She receives a nice send-off, though, as Raven sends a fragment of Jinx's soul to be at peace in the afterlife, and that's apparently that for the character. Jinx is a recent addition to the Titans TV show, having made her first appearance in Season 4's third episode, appropriately titled Jinx. However, she has a rich history in the comics going all the way back to Marv Wolfman's 1980s run on Teen Titans. Interestingly enough, she has been portrayed mostly as a villain in the DC Universe, and as a member of the rogue group known as the Fearsome Five. Well, at least she had a chance to experience being a superhero in Titans. There are only four certainties in life. Death, taxes, superhero death, and the retconning of said superhero death. Besides taxes, the rest happens in Shazam! Fury of the Gods as the titular hero himself meets his maker, even if it is only for a brief period of time and no one believed it would be final. Billy Batson fails to survive a battle against the film's ultimate antagonist, the evil goddess Calypso, who is also one of the daughters of Atlas. However, Billy's death is very temporary here. In the end, Wonder Woman makes a surprise cameo and brings him back to life in a scenario that makes Krakoan mutant resurrection look plausible by comparison. At the same time, it makes the whole concept of death rather pointless in the DC universe. If Wonder Woman knows all about magic and resurrection and can revive others, why didn't she do the same for Superman in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice as well? Then no one would have had to mess with the mother boxes in Justice League. While Shazam receives a second chance at life in Shazam! Fury of the Gods, the same doesn't hold true for the Greek goddess Hespera. Who knows, maybe Wonder Woman wasn't a fan of Hespera, and they had beef a lifetime ago. 
hence why the Amazon didn't bother to even think about reviving her. Hespera starts off the story as one of the main villains and appears to be the big bad of the movie. However, she switches sides and fights on behalf of order and decency before the final credits roll. Unfortunately, her redemption arc does come at the highest price, as she perishes from the wounds after fighting her sister Calypso, who has nefarious plans of her own. To be fair, most villains do tend to meet their maker in comic book movies. And even if Hespera did an about turn to join the good side, what else could she do from a storytelling perspective in the DC universe? But you will never be a true god! Tom King and Greg Smallwood's The Human Target starts with Christopher Chance downing a tumbler full of poisoned whiskey intended for the gullet of the evil Lex Luthor. As per the story, the poison would take 12 days to go through him and claim his life. However, as the reader moves through the series, it always feels like there's a possibility that the human target might manage to outrun the Grim Reaper before it's too late. But that doesn't prove to be the case here, as he dies from the poison right on schedule in the 12th issue. Anybody who has paid attention to DC Comics in modern times knows King tends to set his 12-issue maxi-series in their own individualized Elseworlds timelines. This way, he and his collaborators can decide what to do with the characters without having any real ramifications for the main timeline. But whether or not the human target is considered canonically dead in the primary DC universe, this series deserves mention. It also acts as another reminder of how King has a masterful ability to make us care about C-list heroes such as what he did with Mr. Miracle in the 2017 miniseries. A human target might perish here, but he does so in unforgettable style. Heading into director James Gunn's final installment of his Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy, plenty of fans are bracing themselves for a bloodbath of epic proportions. After all, Dave Bautista and Zoe Saldana had indicated a strong interest in moving away from Marvel, while in the trailers, Rocket Raccoon and Star-Lord both look like they're in pretty rough shape. For all we knew, Gunn would blast the whole zany crew to oblivion on his way out the door and truly close the chapter on this team. As it turns out, the Guardians themselves all survived the events, but Gunn found a totally unexpected way to break our hearts and trigger the tears. In flashbacks to Rocket Raccoon's early years as a living experiment in the High Evolutionary Space Laboratory, we meet young Rocket's adorable cellmates and pals, Lila the Utter, Teefs the Walrus, and Floor the Rabbit. One thing leads to another, and Rocket devises a scheme with the intention to bring his new buddies along with him to freedom. The High Evolutionary has other plans, though, and establishes himself as a truly heinous villain, by cruelly annihilating Lila, Teefs, and Floor. While Thanos might have destroyed half the world's population with a snap of his fingers, the High Evolutionary's actions feel slightly more evil here. These beloved characters' deaths are a moment that not only devastates Rocket, but also the audience watching. Most of us weren't prepared to see these adorable creatures executed in such a devastating way. And we'll kill anyone who gets in our way! No, not kill anyone! During the last episode of the Titans TV show, Superboy spends quite a while lying motionless on a table as his lungs and heart do positively nothing. It appears as if he is well and truly cooked here. In the interest of full disclosure, let's note his comrades and the Titans never seem all that distressed about his apparent passing, except for maybe Beast Boy. And when Connor Kent comes back and asks if he died, nobody gives a definitive answer. Maybe Superboy doesn't die enough for the Titans to qualify it in their minds, but he dies enough for us since he looks dead for a hot minute. Probably the most interesting character in the final season of Titans, Superboy leans into the Lex Luthor side of his genetic heritage throughout much of these 12 episodes. Naturally, he realizes the error of his ways and rejoins his friends when he starts to think he can't shut down Brother Blood on his own. His theory proves to be correct as Brother Blood is the one who nails him with the highly charged magic bolt that proves fatal initially. It is also yet another reminder that Kryptonians are not only vulnerable to kryptonite, but also magic. 